Hello and welcome to part 7 of the online world videos. Nearly there, first only a couple more to go with any luck. And um, then we've got the whole unit done. So this one is on data exchange. Kind of a long one, um, but you should be used to that by now. Um, but we'll, we'll get through it as quickly as we can. So let's go. Right, data exchange. These are the things that we're going to cover. We're going to talk about what data exchange is. We're going to talk about a whole load of different transmission methods. Um, we're going to talk about VoIP, which we've talked about a little bit before, but we're going to talk a bit more detail on that. Uh, we're also going to talk about codecs, what they are and what they're used for. We're going to talk about different ways that you can transmit data. We're going to talk a little bit more about packet switching. Uh, we've covered that in a previous video, and I'll talk about that a little bit more when we get to that. Um, we're going to talk about wireless networks. Uh, and the components you need for them, but when we do it we're going to use two S's rather than one. Um, and also we're going to look at how some websites have client-side processes, some websites have server-side processes. But we'll come to that at the end. Right, what is data exchange? Nice and easy definition. It's basically just passing data between two computers on a network. And that can be a local network, so it's one where you're all connected with cables, or it could be a wide area network, which is one where you're connecting over the internet. But if any two computers are transferring data between them, that is data exchange. So that's what data exchange is. Right, uh, the dreaded hyperlinks coming up. I thought I got rid of all of those. Transmission methods. Right, there are many different ways to move data around. The ones that we're going to be looking at are called simplex, half duplex, full duplex, parallel, and serial. We're going to go through each of those in turn. So, simplex. This is when you transfer some information down a cable, or from one computer to another, not necessarily down a cable, um, but it can only go one way. So, one thing sends it, one thing receives it, can't come back the other way. So, it's a little bit like a one-way street. I'm going to use some street analogies for these simplex, duplex, and half duplex ones. A simplex is like a one-way street. You can only go down it one way. You can't go out. You can't come back the other way. So things that use that are things like a TV remote, because if you think about it, you can use a TV remote to change channels, and it tells your um, TV to change the channels, but your TV can't then tell the remote to do anything. Same with the keyboard. You can type information into a computer with a keyboard, computer can't send the information back to the keyboard. And also the same with a mouse. So you can move things around on it, but it doesn't do anything back to the mouse. Unless I suppose if you have a force feedback mouse, if you can get those for gaming, but that would be the only, only kind of thing. So, simplex, as you can see, one direction only, one way. So we'll move on to the next one now. Hopefully. Right, half duplex. So this is where data is omnidirectional. Actually, if I go back to the other one for a second, I said that it was unidirectional. Unidirectional is a posh way of saying it only moves in one direction. So simplex is unidirectional. Half duplex is omnidirectional because the data can go both ways. But it can only go one way at a time. So it can either be sent there or it can be received back. But you can't do both at the same time. So I've got down here, half duplex, both directions, but only one at a time. So it can either go that way or it can go that way. It can't go both ways. So back to the road analogies. Think of a nice little narrow bridge or a narrow tunnel on a road. You can only get one car through that tunnel at a time. So you either go that way through it or you come this way through it. If you both go through it at the same time, you crash and everything goes horribly wrong, which is what happens on a half duplex line. If you try and send and receive a message at the same time on it, you get data collision and you lose the messages. So half duplex can go both ways, but only one way at a time. Next. Four duplex. So once again, omnidirectional can go in both directions. But this time, it can do both at the same time. So it can send and receive data at the same time. Um, so it's like a motorway. You can go that way along the road, you can come this way along the road. You're not, hopefully, <laughs> going to crash 
in between at any time because you've got two separate channels. You go that way or that way, you can do both at the same time. Um, examples of these, um, so telephones are full duplex because you can talk to somebody on the phone and they can talk back to you. Also on the half duplex one, there was another example, I'm just going to bleep back to it actually. Yeah, I said walkie talkies. So, if you think about all these action films with all these people with the walkie talkies going, okay, Delta Group, go, 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 all this kind of stuff, you never hear somebody talking back to them at the same time. That's because walkie talkies are half duplex. You push a button and you can send information, you can transmit your information. But you can't hear anything until you let go of that button and then you're in receive mode. So you can either send a message or you can receive it but you can't do both with a walkie-talkie, not at the same time. So, with a phone though, you can talk to somebody and they can be talking back to you and you can talk over each other. It's a bit rude, but you can do it. It's part of the technology. So that's simplex, half-duplex, and duplex transmission systems. Next one. Right, parallel transmission. This means that you can send bits of data at the same time. So once again, if you're thinking of roads, this is like a multi-lane motorway. So you can send all these bits of data, you can send them all across on separate wires all at the same time. That's how that cable will work. So it'll have lots of different wires in it, and you can send information down that, each of those things at the same time. Which is great. That works really well. It's very fast. Um, it's faster than serial cables, which is what we're going to talk about in a little while. But you can only use short cables. So 5 meter cable is about as far as you're going to get with a parallel transmission cable. Um, hopefully to help you remember it, when you're thinking of parallel, parallel lines are lines that go like that. It helps you remember the parallel bars in the Olympics are the two bars that are like that. It's not the uneven bars, the asymmetric bars that the girls use when they do the flips from the higher and low one. Two next to each other that are parallel. Parallel bars, hopefully that will help you remember parallel transmission. So, we've said it's faster than serial, so let's talk about serial. Serial transmission. So this time it can only do one bit at a time. It can only send it down one wire at a time. Um, and this is much better over long distances. So you can have much longer cables than five meters to do this. But it's a lot slower, because before we had all of these lanes working at the same time. Now you've just got one lane working at once. So you're going to get less traffic down that one lane than you would if you were going on an eight-lane motorway. Uh, the other problem is it gets a bit more complicated because the data needs to be broken up because it likes to come to be processed in like lots of six or lots of eight. So what it has to do is it then has to split those all apart, decide which order it needs to go in. So that one first, then that one, 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 and then start again. And it sends it down, I think. And then when it gets to the other side, it's then got to reassemble it again to put it back into this kind of structure that computer then likes to use. So it just causes a little bit more problem. If you wonder why I've got a box set of Game of Thrones here, that's because Game of Thrones is a very popular TV series. Series comes from the word serial, and it's called a series because the episodes come out one at a time. They don't all come out at once, and the seasons come out one at a time. They don't all come out at once. If every episode came out at once, that'd be rubbish, because you'd end up watching the last episode first, and then it'd spoil the whole story. So serial, one after the other, one at a time, parallel, lots of things happening all at the same time. So these are our methods of data transmission. We've had simplex, half duplex, duplex, serial, and parallel. So those are the five that you need to know about. Moving on. So VoIP and video conferencing. We've talked about these briefly before. VoIP stands for Voice Over Internet Protocol, and is basically using the phone like an, um, using the internet like a phone. So you stick a headset on and you can talk to somebody else. Um, so what you need for VoIP, as well as an internet connection, you need to have a microphone, because you've got to have something to talk into. You need to have something that you can listen with, so a pair of headphones or a set of speakers. Either will do. Obviously, if you've got lots of people in the room, probably go with headphones, so you're not sharing your conversation with everybody. And that's all you need. If you've got your internet connection, the program that you're going to use for it, you've got a microphone, you've got headphones or speakers, that's all you need for a VoIP call. If you want to do video conferencing, 
which of course is where it's a bit like FaceTime, so you've got the, the image of the person as well, then you need to have a webcam as well. So we need speakers, you'll need a microphone, or speakers or headphones, and you also need a webcam. So those are the components that you're going to need to do video conferencing or to do VoIP. So it's just helpful that you know which ones you need for those things. Right. Codex. So codex are called coders and decoders, and they're used in VoIP to send your voice over the internet. Now, computers work on digital information, which is made out of ones and zeros. Uh, sound works on sound waves, which are analog. So a sound wave looks like that. That would be a sound wave. Now, the computer can't do a sound wave, but what it can do is it can keep measuring where on the little scale that sound wave is and give each of these things a number and then it can send all those numbers through the computer come out the other end and then it can plot all these points on the graph draw the line around the graph and it can recreate that sound or that sound wave and that's basically what a codec does so it's a coder decoder so code deck decoder coder decoder and what it does is it turns the analog signal of your voice into a digital information signal which it can then send over the internet. And it sends it using packet switching, which we've talked about in a previous video. And the whole idea, it changes that analog curve into a set of points. It can then send all those numbers for those points through the internet. And at the other end, it reassembles the curve and plays it through the speakers so you get your voice coming out at the other end. And that's how it works. So it codes it into digital information first, sends it through the internet, decodes it back into the audio wave, and people can hear it. And that's how codecs work, and that's how your voice gets transmitted from one place to another. You don't have to do it with the video, because the video is captured using a digital camera, so it's already in digital form, so you don't need to worry about that. Right, other ways that you can transmit stuff. So, you can have fibre optic cable, which we've talked about before, uh, although I think that might have been in the networking or the Unit 14 hardware videos, probably the networking one. So, it's very high speed, uses a, a glass or a plastic inner core with a reflective surface on the inside to bounce light all the way down the cable. So, it's very, very fast, quite expensive. Um, you can also use Ethernet cable, which are the ones that we have plugged into the back of our machines. So these are quite a good com uh, compromise between speed and price. They've got quite a few different cables in them. Uh, just normal wire cables though, nothing in the way of fiber optics. They will hold a reasonable amount of information and they're quite robust and quite cheap to make. So, but they're not as fast as the fiber optic ones. So if you want to get fast data transfer, use fiber optic cables. So, Fibre broadband is faster than normal broadband because it's using fibre optic cables and it sends the information down to you a lot faster. Um, anything for big data use, like the internet backbones that we talked about in the previous video, I think it was, or the one before last, um, then you'd be using fibre optic because you want the fastest speed possible. But for just a general office use, ethernet cables are fine. Um, then you've got infrared. So this is just using, uh, like on the remote control here, you push a button, the little light comes on, um, and it flashes at different speeds and different frequencies. And then there's a sensor on your TV, or whatever device you're connecting to, and that can then read the frequency of light that's being flashed at it, and can change the channel, or eject the DVD, or whatever it's going to be doing. Um, needs to be in line of sight. If you can't see the light, then it's not going to work. So anything blocking the way, just means that that will no longer work. So you need to have that. It's also quite a slow method of transferring data across. Um, it does work, but it's quite slow. You can still get some peripherals like modems and things like that that will connect to the internet on a phone line and then transfer the information to you over infrared, but they're a bit dire. Uh, they're not very good. Um, other things you can be using, you can use microwaves, so, or radio waves uh, are on a high frequency. So that's things like Bluetooth, and Wi-Fi. Um, it is a lot faster than infrared is. Not as fast as a cable, but as far as wireless connections are concerned, it's pretty, pretty quick. Um, 
but you do have to bear in mind that you're going to be uh, messed about with the range, um, especially with Bluetooth. Bluetooth, I think, ideally works at about 30 metres. Wi-Fi works about 100 or so metres, depending on what your antennas are like. So, yeah, there's definitely a, a, a range problem there. Plus, you get things in the way, electric fields that interfere, that kind of stuff, that will also cut down the range. So, you've got to bear that in mind when you're doing things. Um, and then you've got satellite. So, you can get information sent to you by satellite. It's very, very expensive, though. And it's not particularly stable, because you can only do it when you have a satellite overhead which is great if you've got a satellite that's in geostationary orbit, which means it's always above the same part of the world. If you're below it, fantastic. If it's one that's not geostationary and orbits around the world, you'll only get a signal as it goes past you. Once it goes over the horizon, you're not going to get a signal anymore. It's not going to be travelling through the whole world to get to you. And then you have to wait for the next satellite. So you often get breakups in satellite signal or poor signal, especially if you're uh, mainly satellite things are used if you're out in the middle of nowhere, there's not going to be any normal mobile phone coverage. Um, so if you're in the middle of the Congo doing some kind of expedition in the jungle, um, not only have you got to wait for the satellite to go across, but you've got to have not too much in the way of trees above you that's going to block out the signal too. So you've got to think about those things when you're doing it. And that's the different types of alternative transmission methods that we can have. Right, packet switching. We have talked about this before in part five of the online world videos, which is the World Wide Web one, I think. Um, so that or the internet, one or the other, but it's definitely part five. And in that, I've gone through a whole thing using a different board about how packet switching works. Um, TCP IP protocol is what uses packet switching. And I did say about the fact that it had a header and a trailer, but I didn't go into too much detail on that. So this is the bit where I cover that in a little bit more detail. So. The upshot of packet switching is you have a file and before it gets sent somewhere else it busts it up into lots of little bits and sends all those bits across the internet in lots of different ways and then it reassembles it at the other side. So each of those different bits is a packet and each packet is split in or has three parts to it. So it's got the header, the data and the trailer. So in the header you have a packet ID code you have the destination address, so the address of where it's going to, and you have the address of the person that sent it to you. So if you've sent them a picture to somebody else, one of your mates, it will have the packet ID, it will have their address that you're sending it to and your address that you sent it from. Um, you need the ID to tell the um, computer when it puts all the packets together where that packet goes. Because remember, you've split it up into thousands of different pieces, this image and they're all going different routes through the internet to your friend's house so they're not going to arrive in the right order so you need the packet ID to make sure that everything's going to be put together in the right way. So that's what's in the header. In the data bit in the middle, that's the payload, that's basically just the bit of the file that you're sending. So that's the main chunk of information. So when you split the picture up into bits, this is the bit that's got the picture in it and the rest is just added on to make the packets work. So that's the part that's got the important bit, that's the bit that's got all the information in. And then the trailer bit at the end, oh, that's cool, I didn't touch it. And we're back. So, uh, the trailer bit at the end, that's just used to check that the packets are reassembled correctly. So it's another little way of checking, along with the packet ID, that everything's been put together properly. And if it hasn't, it'll come up with an error and hopefully resort it. And, get the stuff resent again. So that's how packets are made up. You've got a header, you've got the data bit, and you've got a trailer. And that's a lot of those parts. So, that's done. Next. So, we've seen this slide before. Um, wireless network components. If you are making a wireless network, you need to have specific bits of, of equipment to make this. I've talked about this in the Unit 11 videos where I've talked about network components but we'll quickly go through it again now as well. So, you're going to need a wireless router. That's the thing that's going to share your internet connection and is also going to be where all of your network gets funneled into. So, if you've got an internet uh, wireless router, that will connect to the internet and then it will be able to share that out via Wi-Fi. Um, the next bit you need 
is a wireless access point on your network. That means that if you've got other computers on the network, the wireless um, network access point, that's where you actually connect your external devices to. So if you've got a mobile phone, you connect to that access point to be able to get into the network. The access point might be built into your router, might be separate, but either way you'll need to have something that you can actually access the network with, and that device is your wireless access point. And then the last thing you're going to need is a wireless network adapter. So that's something inside your device that you want to connect to the internet or connect to the network that can do that wirelessly. So mobile phones have got them built into them, laptops have only got them built into them. PCs, sometimes you need to buy a special wireless adapter that plugs in, has a little antenna out of that, which then means it can connect to it properly. So those are the three things you need to make a wireless network. You need a router, you need an access point that you can connect to, and you need a network adapter on every single device that you want to connect to the network. And those are the three things that you need. Right. Last few bits then. Um, client side and server side processing. This is a little bit off from the other stuff, but it is part of this particular bit of the unit. Um, kind of goes in with websites more than anything else. So it's kind of like links in with the HTML, but it's also part of data transfer and data exchange and that kind of stuff. So we'll start in here. But basically what it means is when you have a website, there's a lot of crashing going on outside, hopefully it's not disturbing you too much. Um, when you have a website and you download things, um, there are some things that your computer will sort out itself, and there are some things that need to be done on the server. So if you're sorting it out yourself, then it's a client-side processing. So if you've got a website that's got a rollover image, so uh, like if you go onto Amazon and you buy something from Amazon, when you put your mouse over the image, it normally gets bigger and enlarges. Now that will be your own computer sorting that out. It will do all the processing for that particular task. It's all built into the website, it reads the website and it processes all that itself. If you then think, oh yes, I like the look of whatever it is you just bought, uh, I'm going to buy that, I'm going to pay for it, I'm going to fill in all the information and submit it. When you submit it to the website, the website server then deals with your request from there. So that's server-side processing. So you've got user-side processing, which is when your client-side processing, sorry, when your computer is the bit that sorts out the task that it's doing at the time, like rollover images. And then you've got server-side processing, which is when the computer that you're linked to is dealing with stuff. So things like submitting forms and paying for things online, that kind of stuff. So that is client and server-side processing. And that is it for this particular video. So we'll see you in the next one. And yeah, catch you later.